Fishermen in northeastern Japan have agreed to allow decontaminated groundwater from the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear plant to be released into the ocean. The move is aimed at reducing the amount of contaminated water that's building up in the basements of facilities. Some 300 tons of groundwater is flowing in each day and is becoming contaminated. Officials with Tokyo Electric Power Company and the government plan to pump up the contaminated groundwater from 41 wells dug around the reactor buildings. Work will then be done to lower the levels of radioactive substances in the water before it's discharged into the ocean. TEPCO and the government have been asking the fishermen in Fukushima Prefecture to accept the plan. Members of the local Federation of Fisheries Cooperatives gave their approval. TEPCO and the government officials said the rules will be strictly followed, and they said the fishermen will be compensated for any damage from what they say are harmful rumors. I'm not sure all the fishermen are satisfied with the plan, but it's very important to fulfill the plan point by point for the steady decommissioning of the plant. The operator, the government, and an independent institution will check the levels of radioactive substances in the water. People cleaning up the fallout from the Fukushima nuclear accident have begun a new phase of their work. They started full-scale decontamination in a town that received the highest levels of radioactivity. About 30 workers gathered at an elementary school in the town of Okuma. They removed topsoil from the playground. The government says the area will be off limits for a long time. The Environment Ministry launched full-scale decontamination at the request of local authorities. The local authorities have designated this district as a hub for reconstruction. So we're going to carry out a full-scale cleanup to help them. Ministry officials plan to finish decontaminating about 95 hectares by next Abnormalities March. Abnormalities have been found in fir trees near the crippled Fukushima Daiichi nuclear plant. Japan's Environment Ministry has been observing about 80 species of wild animals and trees near the plant since 2011. That's the year Japan suffered its worst nuclear accident. At the ministry's request, the National Institute of Radiological Sciences analyzed fir trees in areas where radiation levels are relatively high. The results were published on Friday. They show that Japanese fur populations near the plant showed a significantly increased number of morphological defects. These include deletions of leader shoots of the main branch axis. The study shows that 98% of fir trees in a 3.5-kilometer area from the damaged plant have such defects. The radiation dose there is about 34 microsieverts per hour. The Institute says the results indicate that radioactive materials emitted during the nuclear accident may have caused such abnormalities. The Institute's Satoshi Yoshida says conifers such as fir trees are more susceptible to radiation, but he says further studies are necessary. Relations between such defects and radiation are still unclear. The Environment Ministry says no abnormalities have so far been confirmed in other animals or trees. These officials plan to step up measures to monitor volcanic activity. They've failed to raise alerts before recent eruptions, and one killed dozens of people. The Meteorological Agency plans to have 240 personnel monitoring volcanoes from April. 160 people do the job now. The agency also plans to set up monitoring units at four of its stations nationwide. Staff will create a database of volcanoes across the country. Officials aim to issue immediate warnings when volcanic tremors increase and on the detection of changes in the Earth's crust. Mount Ontake in central Japan erupted last September, leaving 63 people dead or missing. It's still difficult to predict that type of eruption, which involves interaction between water and magma. Officials plan to study new methods to detect potentially dangerous volcanic Japanese cabinet activity. ministers have set a new cap on the price to build a national stadium for the 2020 Tokyo Olympics. They've scrapped the original plan amid criticism for the skyrocketing price tag. They say they'll now cut costs by 40%. <laughs> We've limited the function of the new stadium to what is needed for the competitions. 
We considered what's best for the athletes and what would suit a main stadium for the 2020 Olympics and Paralympics. Cabinet ministers endorse a new cap that limits construction costs to about $1.3 billion. The new stadium will have about 68,000 seats for the Games. They can be increased to 80,000 if necessary for a World Cup soccer match. The stadium's roof will now only cover the upper seats, and a subtrack for warm-ups will be built within walking distance from the stadium. The stadium is set for completion by the end of April 2020, but the International Olympic Committee requested it finished by January of that year. So the government will seek proposals from designers and construction firms to try to meet that date. Police investigators say the face of organized crime in Japan is about to undergo a major change. They say the country's largest criminal group, the Yamaguchi Gumi, may be splitting. They warn the breakup could lead to violence. Police officials estimate there are more than 23,000 full-fledged and associate members in the Yamaguchi Gumi. The organization is led by Keiichi Shinoda, also known as Shinobu Tsukasa. He comes from an affiliate group that gained power over the Yamaguchi Gumi. The group Kodokai is based in central Japan. Police suspect that at least 10 affiliate groups in western Japan are trying to set up a new syndicate. In the 80s, another group broke from the Yamaguchi Gumi and formed a new organization. It sparked a gang war that left many people Japan's dead. The ruling Liberal Democratic Party has scheduled its presidential election for September 20th. Prime Minister Shinzo Abe is almost certain to be re-elected. Abe's term as a party president expires at the end of September. The party's election committee has set the official start date of the campaign on September 8th. If no other candidate steps forward at that time, Abe will win by default. Abe has expressed his readiness to stay on in the post. All LDP factions support his re-election. Seventy years after the atomic bombing, people from around the world have come to Hiroshima to discuss how to achieve a world free of nuclear weapons. NHK World's Chie Yamagishi has more. The United Nations Conference on Disarmament Issues opened on Wednesday. It brought together 83 people from more than 20 countries, including government officials, experts, and representatives of civil groups. At first, six panelists discussed how to realize a world without nuclear weapons. An atomic bomb survivor described his suffering and warned that further usage of these weapons would destroy humankind. I will never give up my efforts to eliminate nuclear weapons until my last breath. Some speakers said world leaders, including U.S. President Barack Obama, should visit to learn the reality of the bombing. I would be very pleased if President Obama came to Hiroshima and took the occasion to make a speech that, in a sense, he gave his Prague speech at the beginning of his administration. His Hiroshima speech could be at the end of his administration, reinforcing his view that nuclear weapons should be eliminated. Participants then visited the Peace Memorial Park. They offered prayers for those who lost their lives. They also listened to a survivor's testimony. Yoshiko Kajimoto said she injured her arms and saw many people dying with their eyes or internal organs popping out. She also said many children died or suffered. The city was really hell. I don't want to see such horrible scenes again, and you should never watch that either. I hope no more people have to run away while stepping over dead bodies. The whole experience has been so profound. I have been so touched and so sad. We have to keep uh, her stories, uh, the legacies of uh, the eight bombs, so that uh, the future red generations would appreciate it and also to join efforts to, for a nuclear-free world. On day two, Participants discussed the outcome of the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty Review Conference this spring. Taos Feruki of Algeria, who chairs the conference, said there were differences over a proposed nuclear arms-free zone in the Middle East. She said there was a lack of bridge builders. 
Feruki also proposed to set up a working group to consider effective measures for new great disarmament at the next session of the UN General Assembly. The NPT regime is really under stress. Renewed and determined efforts are required to bridge the gap between expectations and achievements. Another speaker called for a summit in Hiroshima so that world readers can discuss nuclear disarmament face to face. Participants have learned what happened here 70 years ago. They renewed their ideas on how to press ahead with nuclear disarmament. Che Yamagishi, NHK World, Hiroshima. The harbor recently saw their night skies light up for a show with great significance. They watched a fireworks display provided by Japan. The launch marked the 70th anniversary of the end of World War II. NHK World's Hiroshi Takashima reports from Honolulu. Fireworks light up the night sky over Pearl Harbor in Hawaii. They come from the city of Nagaoka, home of one of Japan's most spectacular fireworks festivals. The fireworks display has a deeper connection to the history of Pearl Harbor and Nagaoka. About 2,400 people died when the now defunct Japanese imperial military attacked Pearl Harbor in December 1941. Marshal Admiral Isoroku Yamamoto directed the strike. He came from Nagaoka in Niigata Prefecture. In what has sometimes been described as retaliation, the U.S. military conducted a large-scale air attack on Nagaoka. The raid killed nearly 1,500 people. Since then, people in Nagaoka have set off fireworks every August in memory of the war dead. Edwin Hawkins is a second-generation Japanese-American living in Honolulu. He was born in Japan after World War II. His father is American and his mother, Japanese. He served in Japan with the U.S. Air Force. After retiring, he acted as a bridge between the two countries. Six years ago, Hawkins visited Nagaoka as part of a delegation from Honolulu. He was instrumental in the two communities becoming sister cities. Hawkins came to appreciate the meaning of the Nagaoka fireworks as a memorial. He came up with the idea of bringing the display to Pearl Harbor to remember the victims in both countries. Uh, it is for honoring the victims and at the same time to dedicate to future peace. It's the perfect vehicle for honoring the 70th anniversary. But in Hawaii, some people expressed opposition to inviting Japanese fireworks. Even now, naval ships with the remains of crew members lay underwater. The memory of the attack remains strong in the minds of former servicemen. As soon as the general alarm sounded, they says, this is not a drill, this is not a drill. Well, initially it was scary. The U.S. military was also against allowing the Japanese fireworks. The Hawkins kept meeting military officials and former soldiers. He explained it would serve as a tribute. After two years of efforts, Hawkins obtained approval. The day finally came for the fireworks display in Pearl Harbor. About 30,000 people gathered to watch. The fireworks from Nagaoka erupted in the night sky. Hawkins' long-held dream touched the hearts of former servicemen who had survived the attack on Pearl Harbor. 
We thank you very much for Nagaoka. We very appreciate this very, very much. That it will last forever. All of us has to work every day towards peace. And I hope that especially the youth got that message. So this is a beginning, in a sense, to peace in the future. Hawkins hopes to hold the Nagaoka fireworks display on future milestone anniversaries to renew thoughts of peace. Hiroshi Takashima, NHK World, Honolulu.